Hey, what's up everyone? This is Alex and this is my first music tutorial of 2019. This year I'm going to try to make shorter tutorials and this is actually the fifth time I try to shoot, to, to shoot this one because whenever I explain something, I try, I, I, I get I get into ramblings and stuff. I'm just going to try to be direct here though. So, let's talk about 15 orchestral technical terms you need to know as a composer. These are things you must have heard me say in my previous tutorials. These are things you might see in libraries you own and I'm going to explain them to you what they mean so that you understand why they're relevant and important. Let's start with term number one, timber. Now, timber is how um, certain instruments sound naturally due to their physical, uh, as like their physical nature. For example, check out this solo cello melody here. If you have great music culture, you will recognize this is a melody from Haken. If you don't know Haken, please go check out that band. It's an amazing band. Now, if we play that melody though, it sounded, sounded sharp and clear on cello, right? If we take the same exact notes and we put them on solo, sorry, on tubas ensemble, they sound like this. We're doing the same exact notes, same exact octaves, but they sound different. Why? Because the tuba has a different register. It means it has a different color. It sounds more round, warm, deep, but less sharp. The solo cello instead doesn't sound as warm on this octave. It doesn't have such a warm timber. Like, but it sounds way sharper and more noticeable, more crystalline, if you will. So that's timber. That like when you have a different sound. And I'm going to explain this better in other tutorials, but... Uh, every instrument has its own timber. Uh, that's the reason why layering is a thing. Like if I want to get this melody to sound both warm but also sharp, I will do the layering with solo cello and tuba maybe. So now it's both sharp and warm. This is also like the timber um, the, depends also on the frequency range. Like the two things are intertwined. You can think of one or the other. Um, I, I think in terms of frequencies, so other people t think in terms of colors and timber more, but that's how you can understand what instrument to use where. Now, the other thing you need to know, term number two, register. When I mean register, I mean this. For example, the tubas, you can go as low as this. Sorry, this. No, I'm not on tubas, that's why. If you use the tubas, you can go as low as C2, for example. While on cello, I couldn't. Why? Because they have different register. Register is the amount of, like, the range of notes you can play with an instrument. So, from the you go from C2 to D5 in this patch. This bit tuba instrument is not made to go, it is not made to go over D5. You cannot play a note higher than D5 with this tuba, seems like. The shallow, you cannot go low, as low as C2. You can go as low as C3 and get as high as uh, C6. So that range there is the register of it, you know, uh, the, the notes you can play. Now, if you want to learn more about um, registers and timbers, one thing I recommend you to do is to play around with your libraries a lot to understand, oh, the tuba sounds like this, and the cello sounds like this, and the violin sounds like that. Now you know what sounds warm, what sounds cold, what sounds sharp, so now you know how, what to use where. Another cool thing you can do is to go on Google, look for Orchestral Instruments Guide. You'll find a website called philharmonia.co.uk with a guide on every single orchestral instrument. Yes, Googling will save your career, so do it more than you watch my tutorials. Now, term number three. Num the term number three, you see it in Metropolis Arc, portrayed as uh, A3, A9, after the name of a specific instrument. This is the number of instrument players. Uh, there, it's a question that we ask ourselves if the number of instrument players matters that much, and actually it does. So check out, for example, this melody. I played that on the French horn, a9 patch of Metropolis Arc 1. If we play that melody on the French horn A3, it will sound like this. Which is a bit different. Now, there's no legato on this, so that's the first difference. But also, you notice the sound is, is thinner, it's less prominent, it's less aggressive. And the reason for it is that the A9 patch was recorded with nine French horn players. The A3 patch was recorded with three French horn players. It, mean, it means it has a bit of a different timbre. The A9 also uh, means that each note you use is nine French horn players. So if I play a triad with this patch, it will sound like nine plus nine plus nine, which means 27 French horns. Different timbre, 
compared to playing a triad with 3 plus 3 plus 3, which gives me 9 French 1. So I will use the A3 patch more for uh, the French 1 parts that I don't want to be so much in the front or for the chords. While the A9, I'll use it if I want my melodies on French 1 to stand out a lot. Cine Samples has a legendary 12 horns patch on their library Cine Brass, which is one of the composer's favorite libraries because of that reason. 12 French horns sounds huge and amazing. Term number four, you need to know, vibrato. And I'm gonna have a very bad explanation here. So vibrato, say I play this melody on, on violins. That was with vibrato. I'm gonna play it without vibrato now. It is barely noticeable, but what happens is that when I play vibrato, it's like da, 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 da. Oh my god, my singing is so bad. Anyway, without vibrato means that you don't like vibrato is when you have that sort of like vibrating inflection sort of thing. And if you do it well, it sounds good. I'm not able to do vibrato, so it sounds like shit. But if I play without if I sing without vibrato, it's like da 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 at least I try. You know, it's like when you have no vibrating inflection in your note sounds completely linear and completely uh, perfect, perfectly holding a tone. So when you play a string instrument doing the, or a guitar, doing vibrato is when you take the, the finger that is holding the note on the string and you move it around and you get sort of inflection. Uh, but yeah, usually in strings or in orchestral instrument, vibrato is amazing and it and accentuates how expressive something sounds. But if you remove vibrato, you will get a perfect tone, a perfect note. So it's your choice. I always use it. Term number six, five, sorry, legato. Legato, we heard it before on the Harry Potter melody when I played it on French horn A9. If I play this melody without legato on French horn A9, it sounds like this. It's like it's skipping around in between the notes. That's exactly what it's doing. Like, but uh, 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 it's, there's no connection in between the notes, right? When you do legato, you add that connection in between the notes and like you move from one note to the other with a sliding sort of tone. So compared to da 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 da. So that's the difference. Like legato is when you have that sort of sliding tone. When you do legato though, usually you can only write one note at a time. If you play a chord on legato, it's not gonna work unless you have a library that does multiple legato. Uh, so I use legato for my, for my melodies or if I'm doing the VZ chord progressions, which I explain later what they are. Uh, instead, if I'm doing like an entire chord progression on a single patch, I will use sustain. Uh, okay, we're already at the 10 minutes mark and I don't want to make this video longer than it should be because people's attention on YouTube being what it is, people will not watch this video if it's longer than 15 minutes. So I'm not gonna talk about all the 15 points. I'm gonna stop at point number 10. Now I'm gonna talk about point number six, which is ensembles. Check out, for example, this cello playing here. This is the same melody we heard on solo cello before. It sounds like this. The difference is that this ensemble means that this is actually not a single cello player. In this case, there are seven. You can see the number of players on each ensemble in the library's uh, instruction manual, pretty much. In cinematic samples, in Cine Strings 2, these are seven cellos. Now, the difference between um, ensemble, which is term six, and solo, which is term seven, is this. When you have a single person, for example, singing a melody like, oh, 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 oh that Coldplay song, right? If you have a single person sing that, it sounds like that. But if you have like 20 or 30 people sing that same melody, same, same octave, same register, it will sound a bit blurred, it will sound bigger, but also less defined. Why? Because every single person in those 20 or 30 persons group will have a different intonation, just slightly different, and all the, the, the sum of all the different intonations will bring about a chorus effect, which creates that sort of like big, crowd, less defined, but blurry, but also massive sound. That's what you get with ensembles. That's why cello ensembles sound a bit bigger, but also less defined than a solo cello. So the importance of using it, like if you would use an ensemble if you want a big sound, you know, for background stuff, it's amazing. But if you want something to be in the front like hell, then it makes sense to use that maybe melody on solo cello and put it in the front. Because when you play a solo cello, one single person 
playing something, you hear all the details, all the inclinations, all the vibratos, the legatos, the beautiful sound of the solo cello, you hear it. Usually that's the reason why solo parts are um, delegated to incredible players like Tina Guo, because they need to play perfectly. Because if you play solo, everything you do is heard and accentuated. So if you have a shitty solo player, that's terrible. If you have a great solo player, it brings your melodies and song to a whole other world. That's the reason why Tina Guo Solo Cello is one of my favorite libraries. Now, let's talk about instead uh, term number eight, chamber. Now, chamber is when you have, uh, a chamber ensemble is when you have a group of soloists playing together, actually. It's like having three uh, string instruments, like one violin, one viola, one cello, or maybe four, like a quartet. That's a chamber ensemble again. Uh, and to show you the difference, for example, let's listen to this melody here, like this chord progression on this string ensemble. Sounds fine. This is actually 120 strings because of the reason I showed you before. This is a 40, it's a 40 player string ensemble. So each note is 40 players. Put together this triad, 120 people, which is insane. Uh, what I do is, I'm going to show you later what I do to solve that. But this is what the version of this chord progression sounds on a chamber ensemble of three string instruments. Again, smaller, more intimate sound, more detailed. Usually chamber ensembles are usually are used for that intimate sort of music, or you want more detail, more classical stuff. You can do so many more things than you can do with uh, a full string ensemble. Like, you could do, like, there, there's so many details you can add to this, so many articulations, so many movements that will sound way more clear, way less blurred, way less muddy if you do them on solo instruments. So it, this doesn't mean that a cello, like a, a chamber ensemble is better than a big ensemble, nor backwards. They're used for different things. Now, what I do, though, to solve the issue here of using, having 120 string players, which is not necessarily a problem, but understand, it's not normal to have 120 string players. The, 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 I, don't, I, I cannot think of an orchestra so big. Maybe there's been a few, but that's not regular usually in my mind. So what I do is usually I take this and I split it on different ensembles. Because if you have big ensembles like this, like full string ensemble in cinematic string two of 40 players, sometimes you may also have split ensembles like cello ensemble, viola ensemble, violin. In cinematic string two, the cello ensemble is seven players, the viola is seven, and the first violins are 12. Which means if I play this and I split it like this, I took the lower voice of that chord progression and put it on cello ensemble, the seven. Then I took the middle voice, put it on violas, that's 14 in total with the cellos. Then with this one, it's 14 plus 12. Then we have 26 players compared to 120. And it sounds like this. What is the positivity here? The positivity is that first, the timbre is a bit more natural because it's less player. Second, it's a bit less blurred because of that. Third is that I can treat each independently. So what you didn't notice here maybe is that here on the violins, this is a tremolo note, which is a different articulation. I could do that here because this, I'm only like, first thing I could do, sorry, is I could play legato because I'm using like only one note at a time on all the different instruments. When played together, they're playing the chord, but there are, it's as, it's as if each one is playing a different melody, kind of, and that builds the chord. And then I could change articulation independently. So here I have this tremolo, but here I'm playing sustains. So that's something you can do as well. Or another thing I do, like I, I like to think in different ensemble like this, because, like this, because it gives me a different mindset. Like if I'm writing for a single instrument like this, I might write more blocky chords. But if I'm writing voice by voice, I will do more variations on each voice, as you see me do or hear me do in my songs. And that's why my strings sound more natural. So uh, whenever you use ensembles, it's good to do chords that have their own you know, movements in it, whatever. And if you split them like that, you can get good results. Now, term number nine is divisi. Divisi is another way of using ensembles. If, I had, if this was a divisi patch, like this full string ensemble was a divisi patch, uh, what, what it meant is that I could have split this triad like among those 40 instruments. With the divisi section, it's mean like if you have, for example, a first violin section, which is playing divisi uh, triads, maybe you have 12 violins in that, in that section. And divisi means that uh, if you have a triad on 12 violins, four violins are playing one voice, 
Four violins are playing another voice, and four violins are playing the last voice. So it's 12 which are taking different notes. So you are allocating different notes to the same section and splitting it uh, on different number of instruments in that section. That is divisi, which means divided in Italian. Last term for this tutorial, keys witches. Now, keys witches has to have to do with articulation. Articulation means a specific way of playing an instrument. So for example, check out this part, very simple here. It sounds colorful, interesting, I would say, because it's staccatos here, then you have this sort of long staccato, which is a portato, and then you have tremolo here. If you don't know what articulations are, I made a tutorial about them called Articulation Explained and how to use them. I'm gonna leave it down below in the description of this video. But uh, what, what the case which is, is that it's a ghost note that controls your patch changes how the patch works, changes, in this case, the articulation. So, for example, in Metropolis Arc, when you buy this library, you might notice it's split in two folders, two main folders. There's one called single articulation, one called multi-articulation. When you open a single articulation patches, you have like a high strings uh, legato, high strings tremolo, high strings significato, and you can open all of them and, you know, treat one independently. So you have one channel for legato of high strings, one channel for spiccatos, and you can do that, really, but... Uh, I don't think it's intelligent because, like, not in all cases, because if you have a lot of patches like that, you have a different patch for every single articulation, then you will have to do dynamics and stuff like that and automations for every single articulation of every single instrument, and that takes a lot of time. And that's what I did first time I got Metropolis Arc. Then a guy on Reddit kindly told me, you're a freaking retard. There are multi-patches where you can use key switches. I'm like, oh. So I opened them and I opened them and I noticed, wow there is this patch that has all the articulations in it, and that's what key switches are. Like, that, that's what, sorry, key switches are these ghost notes here that control the articulations. So, I noticed, if you trigger these key switches, you switch to a different articulation. So here, this is the key switch to spiccato, which means if I play this note, which is a ghost note, all the notes coming after are going to be spiccato notes. If I play this note, all the notes coming after are going to be portato notes. And this is for tremolos. You can see the key switches here, and as you press them, you see the effect they have on your Metropolis arc. Uh, now, this allows you to compose for the same instrument and tweaking articulations as you go, and this gets you a more natural sound, because when instrument players, like humans, play instruments, they alternate uh, articulations consistently and continuously, depending on the song, how the song demands them to play. And... People, beginners, don't do this, and that's the biggest mistake, not using different articulations other than legato and spiccato. Use them. Like, don't do that. Like, don't, don't not use his wishes, if that's uh, English. Uh, if you want to learn more about articulations, though, that there's lots of things to know, so check out my articulations tutorial or the Avenant course and stuff like that. Now, for Kiss Witches in FL Studio, there is this godsend of plugin called BRSO Articulate, which allows you to trigger key switches without having to go and look for, oh, what key switch is for what articulation? Because with this one, you can allocate key switches or articulation to different MIDI colors. So if you see here, this pattern plays the same way. The reason for it is that now I allocated, for example, the spiccato key switch to the purple notes here. So I, whatever is purple, you know, will have spiccato. This is that is the tremolo. So I go here, you know, I went here, set this to tremolo, change the colors. So here the colors are linked to a key switch, and that is amazing because it gives me, it gives me the freedom to compose without having to go and look for ah, which key switch corresponds to tremolo and having to trigger it before the notes, which, you know, it's it's a good way to go about composing, but it's a hassle also. Um, so if you have BRS Articulate, which is available in FL Studio for free, uh, downloadable to the link down below, you can trigger key switches very easily, and this makes it a pleasure, actually, to compose with key switchers. Otherwise, it's a bit pain, but it's still better, in my opinion, to use key switches compared to using a uh, string like sustain, patch, staccato, uh, tremolo, trail, whatever. So those are the 10 words you need to know. I wanted to make 15 again, but again, I wanted to make this video shorter. Uh, let me know, guys, if you prefer it this way, like if you want my videos to be short like that, or if you want me to provide more knowledge at the cost of the videos being longer. I think this year, though, I might release a course or something like that because 
in that format, people will learn stuff way differently. And the course will give me the freedom to uh, guide you through the process of starting from zero and becoming a great composer. Because if in a tutorial channel like the mine, there's lots of tutorials which can take you there as well. But the tutorials don't have assigned homeworks. I do not follow you as much as I would if I released the course. Uh, and there, you might not know what path to follow, what, what's the, what steps to take, like what order to watch tutorials. So I might make a course later on this year, but for now, I recommend you to check out the Evanon course, which is was a huge foundation in learning much of what I know about orchestral music. Link down below, as usual, in the description, along with the links of the tutorials I mentioned uh, to watch on articulation and be our so articulate. And this is all for this video. I'm going to see you with more videos either this week or the next. But for now, bye bye. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them down below in the comments and share this video with composer friends. Bye.